Hello everyone. So in this pre-lecture tutorial to start chapter 7, we're going to be discussing how it is that chemists keep track of the atoms, the molecules, the ions, or in general the number of particles that actually interact within a chemical reaction. Now as we learned in earlier chapters, we learned that atoms are extremely small. And so as a result, it is extremely unlikely that we're going to be able to actually observe individual atoms interacting. We have to count these atoms or uh, keep track of these atoms in a way that allows us to actually monitor reactions using laboratory equipment. And so as a result, monitoring things individually by particle is just not the answer. And so what we need is a counting unit. So for example, uh, these are counting units on this slide that we encounter frequently in everyday life. So, for example, when we buy donuts, if we were going to buy a larger quantity than, say, one or two, it's often frequent that we buy donuts in dozens, where there are, again, essentially 12 donuts in a dozen. Or if we're going to buy printer paper or copy paper at Staples or, home, or um, Office Depot, basically what we do is we normally buy them in these packets, and these packets are called reams and each ream contains 500 sheets. And so we have these units that are meant to represent larger quantities of individual items. And so chemists have their own version of units like reams or dozens. Basically, we have what we call the mole. And it's important to know how many units are included within this particular counting unit, just so we know that we have 12 in a dozen or 500 sheets of paper in a ream, just like we know those facts, we also have to know how many particles there are in a mole. And so the answer to that is that each mole contains what we call Avogadro's number of particles. And Avogadro's number is this number right here. Now, typically in this class, we're not going to use Avogadro's number to so many significant figures. So we're typically going to use the value as 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And that means there are this many particles in one mole. And by particles, I mean either atoms or molecules or formula units or ions. So the important thing to keep in mind, though, is if you look at the units for Avogadro's number, you'll see that those units are in the form of a ratio. And as we learned at the beginning of the year, when I have units that are ratios like this, I can construct what we call conversion factors. And so we can use Avogadro's number as a conversion factor. Like I wrote it on the previous slide as 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles per mole, or I can also say that every mole of substance contains 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles. Now, the conversion factor that I use, either the one on the left or the one on the right, will depend on how the problem is set up in terms of the given information and also the way that the units work out as I'm trying to get to the proper units for my answer. So to illustrate that, I have a couple of examples on the next slide. So suppose in this first example, okay, that I want to figure out how many atoms, and in this case, atoms refers to the particles that are involved in Avogadro's number. Suppose I want to figure out how many atoms there are in 6.2 moles of aluminum. And so if you recall back to our work in dimensional analysis earlier in the year, the way that we start these problems off is by writing the given information. So I have 6.2 moles of aluminum. Also bear in mind that we usually abbreviate moles as MOL. So that's why I have this written as I have here underneath the problem. So essentially, I'm going to go and I'm going to set up a fraction bar to write my conversion factor. And so these units up here, the moles of aluminum, have to be situated diagonally across from their original location in the first conversion factor so that the moles of aluminum will cancel out. And I want to convert to atoms of aluminum. 
And so that means I'm going to use Avogadro's number as this conversion factor here on the left since the moles are included in the denominator in this conversion factor. So that would mean that up in the numerator I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of aluminum for every one mole. And so if I go and do this math I would need to take 6.2 multiply times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd and what I get if I do that on the calculator is 3.7 times 10 to the 24th atoms of aluminum. Okay now let's take a second example. Suppose that I want to convert 5.3 times 10 to the 25th molecules of carbon dioxide to moles. Okay so Again, the molecules in this case would be the particles involved in Avogadro's number. And I would start with the given information, which is again the 5.3 times 10 to the 25th molecules of carbon dioxide. And so I would set up my conversion factor, and since I have molecules of carbon dioxide in the numerator in my first term, then I would need molecules of carbon dioxide in the denominator on the second term. And so looking back that would mean I would need Avogadro's number in the conversion factor that I've written here on the right with the number of particles or molecules in this particular problem listed on the bottom and that means on top I'm going to be converting to moles of carbon dioxide. And I know from Avogadro's number that there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of carbon dioxide in every one mole of carbon dioxide. And so my units of molecules of carbon dioxide would cancel. And then that would give me an answer when I take 5.3 times 10 to the 25th molecules of carbon dioxide divide by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of carbon dioxide. If I do that math, I should get 88 moles of carbon dioxide. Okay. Now, in addition to this, I can also convert between moles of a compound and moles of constituent atoms within the compound because We've learned about chemical formulas in the previous chapter, in chapter 6. And the way that we've come to understand the subscripts in a formula is that they represent the relative number of atoms or ions involved in a compound. So, for example, if I were thinking about calcium chloride, all right, then the subscripts, I have one understood. So that means I have one calcium 2 plus ion. And if I have a 2 next to the chloride, that means I have 2 chloride ions for every 1 formula unit of calcium chloride. All right. Now, we can continue to think of the subscripts in that way, but what we're going to learn in this chapter is that also means that for every 1 mole of calcium chloride as a compound, I also happen to have one mole of calcium ions, and I also happen to have two moles of chloride ions. All right, here's a similar example down here. Suppose we're considering calcium phosphate. Notice I have a subscript of three by the calcium. So that means for every one mole of calcium phosphate, then I have three moles of the calcium ion. I also have two moles of the phosphate ion. I could also tie that in to atoms as well. That would also mean I have three moles of calcium atoms. This subscript 2, that's outside of the parentheses of the phosphate group, that means I also have two moles of phosphorus atoms in the polyatomic ion, that is the phosphate ion, 
I also have 2 times 4, that's 8 moles of oxygen atoms. And so these subscripts actually give us a bit more information than we originally thought when we were considering them back in Chapter 6. So let me give you an example of how I can use those subscripts to convert between moles of an overall compound and moles of one of the atoms within the compound. Suppose that I would like to figure out how many moles of oxygen atoms are present in 3.7 moles of calcium phosphate. So again, I'm going to set up a dimensional analysis setup. I'm going to go and I'm going to begin with my given information, 3.7 moles of the calcium phosphate. Okay, and... Since I have moles of calcium phosphate in the numerator of my initial step, then in my conversion factor, I'm going to set up the moles of calcium phosphate in the denominator of the conversion factor. And from simply reading the formula, I know that for every one mole of calcium phosphate, I have eight moles of oxygen. So since I want to convert to moles of oxygen, since that's what's being requested, then I would set this conversion factor so that I'm converting between moles of calcium phosphate and moles of oxygen. I would cancel my moles of calcium phosphate. And so what the setup is telling me to do is to take 3.7 and multiply by 8. And if I do that, I get 296 moles of oxygen, but we were given that initial number of moles of the calcium phosphate to two significant figures, and so we would round that to 30 moles of oxygen to remain consistent with the rules of significant figures. So try the follow-up assignment where you get a chance to practice these calculations a little bit more. Again, if you have any questions, please email or speak to me in class, and I will see you guys in school tomorrow. Have a good night.